Now we are going to watch a video to know more about Anima. And we are back. Nick, what you guys do is so amazing in so many ways. For me, the, the biggest question is, how do you start this creative pro process? Is the feeling, it's the uh, result? How do you think, for example, a project like Anima? How did it start it in your heads? Um, so for Anima, it, I mean, the really starting point was just like, it was really like an idea of wanting to see that particular thing in a three-dimensional space, like not as a render or as a drawing, but actually having it there and being able to interact with it. Um, but always with these kind of works, they have so many different facets. So you also have a big production part and there's a lot of questions there, like what's actually possible? Um, what does the space look like? What is the team I can work with? Uh, so there's all these questions and my work mainly is to make sure that all these things are combined and uh, work together as one thing so that it feels as, a, as I would describe it as making a composition, but then not, no longer just a sound composition, but uh, a spatial composition of all these elements. So it's something visual, something audio, something you can position your body in 3D space with and interact with in, in a really three-dimensional way. Um, and I always try to think about how the audience would experience it. That's for me very important. So I, I always try to hide all the technology as much as possible mm -hmm. while we use like very advanced tools. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's uh, like, I, I really believe it's like just tools and technology is here to serve like a, 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 a conceptual or aesthetic goal but we still want to use the, the best tools to achieve that. And um, yeah, so I, th I really think the audience experience is the, like the most important thing. So I always try to uh, walk in a space and, and try and experience it from someone who has never seen it before. And um, really try to make it so intuitive that it just feels like something natural and something alive. Mm -hmm. That, uh, yeah. And uh, to, to connect on what, uh, what Nick said uh, in his uh, explanation, I think uh, one point that's really kind of important or what really connects us is that we, we both studied music technology. So our background and our thought process is very much from the music. But you can see space and you can see uh, a, a, a source of light also as part of, of a composition. It's actually a musical parameter. So we, that's also how we kind of approach the, 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 the development of the piece. And your works are so technological developed. My, did, did, do you have any project that was stopped because the technology couldn't get there? Uh, no, be, because then that's the thing. Like if we would, 
uh, that's not the way our process works. So what we always do is we so like Salvador described from in school, trying to understand what's te technologically possible and then applying it to a certain situation, uh, like that's a very important step. So we wouldn't go like, just come up with so something random and then like, oh, we can't do it, never mind. But then it, you go back and forth a lot. Mm -hmm. So you go back and forth between the technologies that are available, the people that can actually work with these technologies, like make custom software, for example. Um, the space to production, like again, is this very complicated 12 dimensional puzzle you have to solve every time. And if you solve it well, and uh, I think solving it well for us is putting a lot of energy and attention and love into it. And that makes it really good, I think. And if you have the concept there and you work with a certain technology, but it's not really working for the concept, you just search for another technology or maybe not even technology or a sound or so you find ways to create that experience with the ingredients that you have so sometimes it happens that you have something enhanced that you think is really powerful but you put it out there and it doesn't really make sense then it just doesn't make it yeah or the other way around like even some uh, tools we're using can uh, like we're we're working with it and we're like oh wait a second this is the work and we change yeah. the concept yeah so, yeah, so we just take that one little element yeah, yeah everything that really happens a lot eh, where yeah. it ends up being this tiny thing that you didn't know yet existed so mostly it's uh, building in the flexibility in the process to be able to change everything and people that hire us i think really hate this because <laughs> they just want to know like we're paying for this what are we getting and then we're like two weeks later like yeah well we've been working on it and it's gonna be this <laughs> yeah and last night we changed everything yeah. yeah and it's like constant negotiation in a way because you have to convince them that it will be better this way but you know that's not really how the world works often i, I had a question about anima because you told us that you test yourself because the, the, the audience is very important for you. Do you also use testers? Do, do you try things out in the beginning that you are looking at people going in in a room where Anima is uh, uh, there and then see how they react and how yeah. they interact? I mean, at a certain point. So I would say um, for the first uh, test audience is us and the other people around us. And I really trust that uh, we all are like super specific and uh, critical about what we are doing. So I really trust that if we all agree that it's okay, okay. I'm like, we're there almost. And then of course, it's good to see like, let's say the first week of work is in an exhibition, like the first visitors, you see certain things and uh, you change it a little bit. So we have mm. had this thing in, <laughs> yeah. in Barcelona. Yeah, what is yeah. <laughs> we have had this thing where, uh, we have the installation running all day. So we would come there. We first had a week to make it like site specific and then we would run it and then we'd be like. Oh. But we could only work when it was dark. Yeah. Oh, that was why. And yeah, okay. it was, and they told us beforehand that we could work very late, but that changed. So we only had a few hours every day yeah, two, to two work. Two or three hours. Yeah, it was really kind of. Like after the audience wasn't there. So then we're like, we're standing there and we're seeing things like, oh no, this doesn't. And then we'd quickly program it. And then the next day we would run it again. And we realized again. So the last day we're like, yeah, now it's now done. Yeah. And that was the last day. <laughs> so that, that actually uh, happens a lot. So that the first iteration mostly isn't the final work. And it's Anima because it's already running for quite a lot. What was the first year? Seven years, Seven years now. Is it, is it fixed now or, or is it still changing depending on the situation where it's I would say the content exposed. is pretty good now. So it's like we do tiny things like volume things. Well, sometimes. the whole code, <laughs> the whole code was rewritten yeah, I was recently. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. True, yeah. But the, so the software side, like the last thing we changed, we did the exhibition in Shanghai, like November. And because we couldn't fly there, we had to figure out a new production method. So we worked with a local team that had everything, like even that sphere, they apparently already copied it in China, you know, the like <laughs> gr great thing about China, <laughs> yeah, China they already did it, sphere. but it didn't have all the other stuff. Uh, so what we did is we first used different programs like Ableton Live connected with a, a render engine, connected with 4D Sound. Um, so what we wanted to have something that's easy for them to install over distance without us being present. And that is, they can't copy our content. So what we did, we made, uh, a program that had multi-channel audio, all the data, all the rendering in one and had very good encryption. So we just put 
in a deadline. So it ran for two weeks and then it just quits. Auto destroys. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that that that's like the last version now. So. And there's one more thing I want to build in for Lille, which is in a month, is that you can also schedule when it goes on and off automatically. So it's, it's like the tweaking gives you all these options, but for a big part, the same uh, software platform also runs uh, in our other installations so that the tools we develop, we can reuse as well. Yes. Yeah. And now let's see a little bit of uh, Anima. We are back and my question is, what was the purpose of Anima? What are you teasing the audience to experiment with it? Uh, yeah, the, the original idea was to then really the, the whole um, AI uh, boom, let's say, was really starting. So we want to make something that really feels like a, a living entity and you that you can interact with in real life. So it's not like something we talk about in a movie or something that's an abstract idea, but an actual thing, of course, an artwork. Um, that you can interact with and it changes its behavior based on your presence and movement and, and uh, actions in the space around it. And uh, how did you split the work between you two in this project? Did you program more? That's what I understood from the conversation before. Uh, no, I, I actually I don't uh, program anymore. I'm really focused on the, on the sound part. Mm -hmm. So uh, Nick uh, came uh, with the project uh, as it was, like a first version, and he wanted to create uh, a version that developed more over time, which had kind of trying to depth the, uh, the, the meaning of uh, different chapters, etc. We really wanted to research different materials. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to research uh, wood, we wanted to research uh, metal we wanted to and uh, some uh, elements we really uh, started recording and we started analyzing etc and my part is mo much more on the sound side and then Nick is much more focused on the visual and, and the interactive and etc so to in order to uh, uh, connect on this like I, I made chapters I sent it to Nick he listened to it uh, uh, we, we, a lot of back and forth. This is kind of, it's always a conversation. And I think uh, by having a conti continuous conversation, we also consciously and subconsciously adapt to each other. So I made a certain part and he was like, wow, I, this is, it brings up certain uh, colors or a movement that I've seen that I uh, created or a, a new idea that he, he, he then goes to the software developer and sees, well, I want to have this kind of movement because it works with this sound or the other way around. So they come with up with a new movement and then uh, the sound changes or there is a, a, sometimes it's very synchronized, sometimes it's very detached. So this is a continuous conversation over a, a longer period. How, how do you compose for it? Because the sphere changes while the people change uh, around it. So how does the sounds, how do you think about the compositions to fit this? Yeah, maybe I should first explain, I realize now that we have made so many versions. So <laughs> it is called, it's called one work, but it's actually like 17 different installations. Uh, the thing is, we first made a version which has uh, tracking sensors in it. We did like a lot of versions with it, like six or seven maybe. At some point, I realized that if you tell the audience it's interactive, and it, it uses motion tracking, that it, they walk up to it and they start waving their hands. And, and it's, it's, like, it's like Disney World. And we didn't want to do that anymore. So at some point we took out the sensors and I noticed that the audience, instead of staying five minutes until they understand the trick and walking away, they stayed sometimes literally two hours. So then I realized, okay, having a longer tension arc is so much better for the experience of this work. And, and this is very difficult because curators of festivals and museums, they want to have this trick because they heard about interactivity and they want to have this trick. So they, they sometimes try to force us to use sensors and we have to teach them that it doesn't work. Yeah. But, and, and we know that for sure, but they don't know that yet. So that's always a difficult For thing. this work. So from now on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no sensors. So then the next step, what Salvador described, we want to have this longer tension arc. So then we started working together on the composition to make something that has chapters and is interesting for a longer period of time. And you can really lay down and um, uh, experience it for longer, but it stays interesting. And if, if it's interactive, 
We did all this kind of generative things, like the notes would change when there's more interaction compared to the average of this. And we had like all these systems, but still it was a bit, it was less interesting over time. Yeah, uh, people I like think. to be entertained somehow. Like Yeah, and having also having a, an artistic intention in the mm -hmm. timeline, you lose this if it's pure interactive. Mm -hmm. That's what we learned from this project, from doing all these versions. I think also that it, it's different for each project, uh, but the amount of interaction is it's a very fine balance. Mm, yeah. If there's too much interaction, uh, there is the intention is gone. Yeah. If there is, uh, so for some pieces, the interaction is really essential. But it, we also in that we kind of discover it while we make the piece. So sometimes we want to have interaction, and in the end we take it out and it also happens that we work on something and we have this one element that would be really nice to have interactive and so that's we, like the last project we did was yeah. basically this where we made almost everything interactive yeah from like heart rate variation uh, heart rate variability to sound composition and we made this ridiculous nobody's ever seen that actually yeah yeah okay but it, this if you see this system it's like what did they do but nobody sees it so yeah it also changed the software changes over time because we started noticing well this has to be interactive but this we thought that needed to be interactive but actually if we compose that then this becomes much stronger so yeah. That, that's also why, again, everything needs to be open. Also, the software developers. Mm -hmm. So they need to adapt to whatever they build, and sometimes we redo the whole thing if it's necessary. Is it always interaction for, for, uh, with Anima, for, with one person at, uh, at the time? Or are no, it was, it was more, and it, but it, because you have groups and you can't predict beforehand how many people are in the room, yeah. you get these very complicated systems to make you know, averages over time and then make conclusions based on how the people moved before and at the moment. So we, we did try a lot of different things and also different tracking cameras. But in the end, we just concluded that as an artwork, the interaction makes it worse and not better. So we, we took it out.